Hello, welcome to the Fantastic Fiction and KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fantastic Fiction at KGB, which has been an ongoing series for probably over 20 years. Usually my co-host is Matt Kressel. Um, he's off on vacation this week, I believe. I'm Ellen Datlow, and my co-host tonight is Rajan Khanna, who will be introducing Paul Park later. Um, first of all, oops, ah, um, Pung Shepard has brought some books to sell during the intermission, um, paperback, trade paperbacks of her cartographer's, I'm sorry, what's the cartographer? Yes, the, Br the British edition and the um, American edition, so she'll sign books for you. And I have a few books that I'm going to be giving away in the middle. I don't know how yet, um, but we will figure it out. You can all, we can have a scramble. We can have a mud wrestling contest if people are interested. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, um, our forthcoming readers over the next few months, we have May 10th will be John Langan and Paul Tremblay, June 14th, Nathan Ballingrud and Dale Bailey. July 12th, Michael Sisko and David Surface. August 9th, Steve Berman and our in inevitable TK. Um, September 13th, Benjamin Percy and Gesundheit and Josh Roundtree. October 11th, Livia Llewellyn and Robert Levy. November 8th, Cadwell Turnbull and someone else. <laughs> and December 13th, Holly Black and someone else. So that's what we have coming up. But tonight, did I forget anything? You don't know, because you don't do this. I think I have everything covered. Um, our first reader tonight is Punk Shepherd, uh, who is a nationally, let me see if I can do this both with the mic and the light, ah, is a nationally best-selling award-winning author of The Book of M and The Cartographers. Her novels have been named Best Book for 2022 by The Washington Post, Amazon, Elle, and The Verge, Best Book of the Summer by Today Show and NPR, and Pick of the Month by Good Morning America, as well as Option for Television. I assume that's the cartographer or the Book of M? Yeah. Okay. What, the Book of M? Huh. Both? Both. Both? Both. Unofficially both. <laughs> okay, unofficially, but don't tell anyone. That's great. <laughs> um, she was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, where she rode horses and trained in classical ballet, which I would love her to show us, but I'm sure she doesn't want to. <laughs> Uh, both. <laughs> well, the ballet you have with you, the horses yes, you don't. Horse. You and um, has lived in Beijing, uh, Kuala Lumpur, London, New York, and Mexico City. Please welcome Hong Shepherd. Oh, hi. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming tonight. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to Ellen and Matt and Raj. I think Matt was not here the last time I read here, too. He was also on vacation. Uh, this, probably not personal. Huh? It's probably not personal. I know, I mean, at this point, right? It's the second one. Uh, yeah, so this, this is my second time reading here. The first time, I think, was back in 2018 or 2019 or something. So it's been a while. I'm very excited to be back. Tonight is also my birthday. So, <laughs> so if you did want to get me a present, you could, you could, you could buy the book. I'm kidding. Um, so the, the uh, book I'm going to read to you tonight is The Cartographers. It's a dark academia fantastical mystery. And it follows a young woman named Nell who discovers after the death of her brilliant but estranged father that a seemingly worthless map hidden in his things actually contains a deadly secret. And I'm gonna read from near the beginning, but I'm also gonna 
skip around a little bit to kind of get as much of the story as I can in the 15 minutes. So when I skip, I'll just briefly tell you what, what we're skipping and then, then I'll keep going. But well, but this might take, <laughs> I gotta give you backstory. So the backstory that you need uh, for to understand this excerpt, uh, the so the main character, Nell, she grew up in the world of cartography. Her mother, who was a famous cartographer herself, she died when Nell was a baby. And Nell was raised by her father, Dr. Young, who's also a very famous cartography scholar. And Nell spent her life trying to impress him and live up to him and you know earn his, earn his respect as a way to get closer to him. And when she finishes her PhD, she gets hired at the institution where he works, which is our uh, New York Public Library, the map division in the New York Public Library. And her father's best friend, the director and um, like the head of that division in the book is named Swan, and he becomes kind of her mentor slash uncle slash surrogate second father. So everything is perfect for about a year, and then uh, one day in the archives, Nell finds that very same seemingly worthless map that I mentioned earlier. And she and her father get into a fight over it because she's curious and he says it's worthless. And the argument gets so bad that he ends up firing her and basically destroying her reputation. And so she's now not only lost her job, but her place in the field that she loves and also the only way that she thought she had to reconnect with her father. So she hasn't been back to the New York Public Library or seen Swan since her father fired her until now. Just before the scene begins, Nell receives a call that her father was working late at his office and he passed away at his desk overnight. And she's now back at the library for the first time in seven years. A long time ago, the room in which Nell was now standing had been her favorite place in the whole city. The public areas of the library were breathtaking. She could not deny the almost otherworldly beauty of the rich wood paneled walls, the gleaming chandeliers overhead, the old windows that loomed from floor to ceiling. But it was the simple, endless archives of the back offices of the map division that had secretly kept her heart. They contained tens of thousands of books and atlases and almost half a million sheet maps in their vast stores. If she had ever believed in magic, here would have been the place where she would have gone looking for it. Even now, as she ran her hands over the back of her father's leather office chair and breathed in the musty scent of ancient paper and wood, it was hard not to imagine some secret tucked between the pages of an unassuming text. Every time her father had brought her with him to work in her youth, he'd sat her on that chair's well-worn cushion and promised her in his deep, solemn voice that this office would be hers one day. She had believed him. Heart attack, looks like, the officer said, to draw Nell's attention back. He probably went fast. Age catches up to us all, unfortunately. I just, Nell sighed. Despite everything, the chasm between them, the damage they'd both done to each other, tears were threatening. She pinched the bridge of her nose to stop them from falling. Why don't we give her a minute, Swan asked Lieutenant Cabe, who said he'd go check in with his partner on the other side of the room and circle back. Are you all right, my dear, he asked once they were alone. Yes, she said. She didn't know. Let me get you a tissue, he patted her shoulder. I'll be right back. Nell smiled gratefully. Thank you. The library's back offices swirled quietly around her as she sat huddled on the edge of her father's desk next to the mess strewn across it. Researchers were finally getting to work in their cubicles, turning on their computers and shuffling through their mail. And past the staff door, patrons were browsing the stacks and choosing seats at reading tables, clicking on lamps and pulling out notebooks and flipping pages. Children were running through the aisles and sneaking around the lobby. Taxis were pulling up and dropping off passengers outside. Nell tried to think about all of it out there and nothing in here. Gradually, she realized her hand was resting on the corner of the desk where the hidden lock was. Ever dramatic, her father had long ago had a secret compartment built into his desk that only he, she, and perhaps Swan knew about. He kept especially valuable maps inside while working on them, for security's sake, he'd said, even though the New York Public Library had never been robbed in the history of its existence. But when Nell was young, and he'd been a slightly gentler version of himself, 
He had also hidden little notes to her in there as well, and she would reply with childish drawings of maps she'd copied or created herself. All she had to do was push her index finger forward a little bit. The dullest, quietest thud told her the compartment had opened. Slowly, without moving anything but her hand, Nell reached inside. There was just one thing there this time, a slim, leather-bound shape. Not a book, but a leather portfolio. She moved her fingers another subtle inch, feeling the familiar texture. It was the leather portfolio, she was certain. The one that had originally belonged to her mother before she died, and Nell's father had taken to using it as a way to remember her. That was another thing he promised, that one day this portfolio, the only keepsake of her mother, would also be lovingly passed to her. As a child, it had held almost magical power to Nell. She used to watch him slip it into and out of his briefcase when he went to work or came home in the evening, trying to imagine what beautiful work could lay inside that time. There were other maps he brought home too, but those came in clear plastic sleeves or cardboard folders. Only the most valuable, the most rare, were carried in the leather portfolio. Nell wondered at all of the priceless maps she must have laid eyes on as a small girl that she couldn't even remember now. Long after she and her father had stopped talking, she had sometimes thought of the portfolio, about the things he still carried inside of it. And now here it was, hidden in the mess. Lieutenant Cave was still at the door beside his partner, the two of them giving instructions to the rest of the employees in the corridor, and Swan was over at the bookcase, plucking tissues gently out of the box to bring back to Nell. For a split second, no one was looking at her. Before she could think about what a huge mistake it would be, how much trouble it could get her into, Nell slipped the portfolio out from the compartment and into her tote bag in one smooth motion and returned her hand to the top of the desk. By the time Nell had clambered up the old creaking staircase to the fifth floor and wedged herself through the door into her apartment, it was after 10 o'clock at night. Her stomach was growling, having missed both lunch and dinner, but she ignored it. She kicked the door closed and turned the lock, then collapsed in a heap onto the kitchen table with all of her belongings. The rest of the day had been nothing short of torture. Nell had spent hours answering Lieutenant Cabe's endless questions and accepting Swan's comfort, the whole time not daring to open her bag and take out a granola bar or her phone or even her lip balm, lest she draw attention to what was inside. When she'd slipped it from her desk into her tote bag, she'd been able to tell by the feel and the weight of it that there was only one thing inside, a single, medium-thick, folded paper, which of course meant the map. It was the famous young portfolio. It could be nothing else. Had her father located a rare, previously unknown copy of a historical set? Had he convinced a billionaire to donate a priceless piece to the NYPL? Whatever it was, it would be incredible. Nell couldn't believe she'd actually taken property from the library, and of course she would return it to Swan. But she also knew that even if she could replay the day, she'd still have snatched the portfolio all over again to see what was inside. And now she was about to find out. With a thrill, Nell eased open the leather cover. She stared for several seconds. What? She finally managed. She had been imagining something old, or astoundingly rare, and most likely controversial. A disputed maritime routes map, or an early diagram of Brooklyn, pre-bridge. Something worthy of a place inside the leather case. This, she didn't understand. It was technically a map, yes but not any kind of map she would ever expect to see here. It's a, uh, she stammered, a gas station highway map? Why on earth did her father, one of the NYPL's most revered scholars, have an old, cheap, fold out road map in his prized portfolio? And most of all, why on earth was it the same old, cheap, fold out road map that he'd fired her for seven years ago? Okay, so we're skipping. So Nell is, of course, very upset at this discovery. Um, she doesn't understand why her father would have kept the map all this time if it was so worthless, or if it wasn't worthless, why did he insist it was, and then ruin her life over it. So she stews about it for an hour, uh, and then she decides to enter the item into the inter-institutional database, which is this kind of archive that every museum and library has access to, where you can see different editions of, of text and, and artifacts and, and maps. Um, 
kind of as an insult to him to have the very last thing that he worked on be recorded as this worthless, kind of cheap, embarrassing thing. But after she enters her copy, she sees that there are 212 copies of the same map in existence at other institutions, and they have all been marked as either missing or stolen. And so she decides she needs to talk to Swan. The next morning, the subway was a crush of bodies, strollers, backpacks, and buskers, somehow managing to sing and dance in the cars, even though there was hardly any room to breathe. Once the train passed beneath the river and clattered into Manhattan, Nell escaped to stop early at 33rd Street to walk the last half mile to the library. She needed time to rehearse what she would say to Swan. The breeze was still chilly, but the sun was out, bright and strong. At each red light, she tried to come up with a speech, but every time it turned green again, she had no more than a few rambling sentences about the mess in her father's office and the strange database logs. Nothing that would convince Swan it was a map whose origins were worth pursuing. As she rounded the corner, however, Nell stopped dead in the middle of the sidewalk. Something was wrong at the library, again. Across the street, parked all along the front of the NYPL, was an entire squad of police cars. Inside, the lobby was chaos. Reporters jostled amid a sea of uniforms and librarians, cameras held over their heads. Nell pushed her way through the mass, trying to figure out what was going on. A protest, a fight, a fire? There was no way it could be about her father again. Within those halls, he was a legend, but outside of them, she doubted a random patron could name even one of the researchers or curators. As she edged forward, elbow by elbow, the crowd seemed to thicken toward the right side of the building. Please don't let it be the map division, she prayed. Let it be some other collection. But the further she pushed, the more decisively the clamor in that direction heightened until there was no other doorway for which she could be aiming but that very exhibit. And that was when she saw the blood. So Nell learns that the library was broken into overnight and its longtime security guard who she's known since childhood was killed. Henry was dead. Kind, funny, patient Henry, who always let her skip in the hallway when she was a kid, even though it wasn't allowed, or take more books off the shelves to read than she should, or interrupt him any time at the front desk to ask where in the building Dr. Young or Swan was, and he always knew was dead. And only a day after her father. You knew him well, Lieutenant Cave asked. She had to find her voice. Yes, she croaked. He worked here since I was seven. Then a horrible thought. Was Henry the only? Dr. Swan's all right, Lieutenant Cape replied. He wasn't here at the time of the robbery. We're estimating it took place around midnight after he'd left for the night. Thank God, Nell said. So overwhelmed, she worried she would faint. Robbery. Lieutenant Cape had said robbery, she realized. The magnitude of the situation, what all of this chaos and Henry's death meant, finally cut through her shock. She spun around. The next most important question after Swan's safety, repeating frantically in her mind, what did the thieves take? Her eyes rose to the gallery wall, where the pride and joy of the NYPL's collection, Abel Boole's new and correct map of the United States of North America, 1784, had hung for years. Nell had been there, just nine years old, filing paperwork for pocket money from her father when the crate came in from the Chathams, some of the library's most generous benefactors. There were only seven copies of the Boole map still in existence, and they all had been housed at museums or hanging in private collections for generations, including this one from the Chathams, which they had purchased from another family decades ago for a million dollars. At the time, Nell had wondered why they were willing to lend such a rare, precious piece to the NYPL, tax break or not. She had been terrified it would be stolen, and now it had been, except it was still there on the wall. I don't understand, she finally said. What do you mean? Lieutenant Cave asked. The Boole map, she murmured. It's still there. It is, he agreed. He was studying her closely. Why are you surprised? It's the most valuable piece in the map division, she replied. If someone broke in, I don't know what else they could have been searching for but that. Even if they were after something else, to walk right by it and not take it. She turned to Lieutenant Cave. What did they steal? She asked desperately. She could not read his face, except to know that he was telling the truth when he finally spoke. They didn't steal anything. What? She gasped. 
Lieutenant Cabe nodded. Not a single thing. Nell couldn't make sense of it. You're saying that thieves broke into the most historic library in New York, didn't trigger the alarm, killed Henry, had free run of the entire collection, and then just left? Lieutenant Cave opened his hands to indicate he didn't understand it either. As far as we can tell, yes. Either they were spooked by something, or maybe what they were looking for wasn't in the library last night. Nell's blood ran cold. It couldn't be. There was no way that what the burglars had really been after was her father's map. Thank you. And you can find out what else happens by buying the book right now and having the author sign it. So please do that. We'll be back in about 10 minutes. Have a drink. Keep hydrated. Tip your bartender. And I will show you the books that I am going to be giving away. I don't know. We're about to start, we're going to do the book giveaway, actually. What we're going to do, first of all, hello, first of all, I'll ask you if you want, the, who wants a specific book, and if you do, I will pick a number between 1 and 20, and I will write it down to prove that it's, I'm not changing it, <coughs> and whoever gets closest to that number will win that book, okay? And either I can sign it or not, I don't care. <coughs> the first book is Twist of the Tail. Cat Horror, with a cover by Harry Morris. I edited it a long time ago. If anyone's interested, raise your hand. No one's interested, okay. Oh, so how many, all right, all right, I don't know how many there are of you, but I'm gonna pick a number between one and 20. Okay. Six. Who said six? Nobody. <laughs> okay. Seven. Actually, five is on the nose. So you got this one. <laughs> okay. Oh, and here I, I just clipped it out. But there it is. Okay. All right. All right. Nah. All right. Here's another one. Okay. The next book is the fifth Omni book of science fiction from my very old days. Whoever is interested, can we will. <clears throat> it has stories by all kinds of people. I don't know. It like, doesn't matter. You'll see. Yeah. If you're in it. All right. I'm, and be, again, I'm going to pick a number between 1 and 20. Okay. Whoever? Yes? 18. 13. 12. 14. 8. 7. 5. 4. That's it. You got 12? 12. It was 11. Oh. <coughs> Someone said 12. So that's the closest. Here. I can prove it. Here. Here. Okay. Next, we have <clears throat> Black Thorn, White Rose, edited by me and Terry Windling. It's a, it's the second, it's the second um, book in the fairy tale series that Terry and I did. <clears throat> it's fantasy. I will adult fantasy rather than children. Um, I'm going to pick a number between one and twenty. Seventeen. Nah. Three. <laughs> Seven. Eight. Four. Someone said three? It's not, it's a uh, two. <coughs> Here we go. Okay, now we have these two arcs of a book that's coming out May 2nd. It's terrific. It's a novella by Cassandra Kaur. It is Vicious Mermaids, Plague Doctors. It's grisly. It's wonderful. It's called this, <coughs> it's a salt grows heavy. And I have two copies of these. And um, if people want them, we can, I'll, I have two. I will <coughs> pick Good. One number at a time or two? I don't know. What do you think? Whatever you like. I don't, yeah, right. All right. One number at a time. I'll do one number at a time. Okay. <coughs> okay. What? It doesn't have to go to a woman. Why? <coughs> Wait, two people said 13. You can't both say. I got two copies. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so no one else is interested? It's Four. really good. Okay. Anyone else? One. Okay. That's it? All right. The number was six, so four gets it. Whoever said four. <coughs> and we have one more. Okay. 
Okay. Anyone want it? Eleven. You're the only one who wants it? Eighteen. One. It's really good. It's coming out May 2nd. Okay. Um, eight was the number. Okay, now it's your turn. Good evening, all you beautiful people. It's nice to see you here. Um, I don't have anything to give you, so I apologize. Um, my name is Rajan Khanna. I am standing in for Matt Kressel, whose soul is trapped in the body of a ventriloquist dummy. Um, I know Ellen said that he's on vacation, but that's just his body, so, um, so let's think about him. Um, before I introduce our next reader, I just want to say that the KGB Bar hosts this series and has been hosting this series for as long as I've been coming, which is uh, really a long time. So um, please buy drink. Ooh, son. Please buy drinks, um, wine, soft drinks, soda, Negronis, whiskey. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but just you know your favorite drink. Please um, support the bar. And I will introduce our next reader, who I have referred to in social media as my nemesis. I won't go into the details, but he knows what he did. No, I'm just kidding. He, he's amazing. He, he was one of my teachers at Clarion West. He's a great guy. He's a brilliant writer. Paul Park is the author of three collections of short stories, most recently A City Made of Words from PM Press. His 12 novels include A Princess of Romania, Celestis, and All Those Vanished Engines, which is great. His work has been nominated for the Nebula and World Fantasy Awards, among many others. He recently retired from teaching writing and literature at Williams College for many years, and is currently working on a series of screenplays for Sunhouse Productions. He lives in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, with his wife, Deborah. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Paul Park. I thought I'd read a short story. Um, uh, this came out uh, a couple of years ago, maybe in a one of uh, uh, Brad Morrow's wonderful conjunctions anthologies. This one was dedicated to um, stories that take place during the nighttime, um, and it, it 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 has another aspect to the writing a bit. Um, uh, a friend of mine wrote a story named um, uh, Anasognosia and dedicated it to me. And, and at first I was sort of um, gratified by that until I sort of looked up what Anasognosia means, which I didn't know before. It sounded like a kind of a, a minor muse in Greek mythology that something bad happens to. But, um, it turns out to mean a, um, a a medical condition that doesn't know itself, you know. So uh, typically a a, a a mental condition where the patient doesn't um, understand that they have this mental condition. And so I was thinking, what the heck, you know? <laughs> you know, it's about a man who gets hit on the head and then like has no idea what he's doing and I'm thinking what the heck there's a way in which it um, you can see that it mirrors certain sort of techniques that I use in writing and that was sort of gratifying in a way and there was a sort of a tickle of gratification but also of paranoia where I thought well how would I even know like, <laughs> so um, uh, I thought well two can play that game <laughs> So I wrote this story, also called Anasognosia, and it's for John Crowley. <laughs> I don't sleep much except during the day, and I work at night, my habit, for several years. In autumn, in this northern climate, the dark extends its arms a little longer each day. The sky is still black in November when Maggie gets up, and I am at my desk in the corner of the room. When it's hard for me to do my work as now, instead I watch her as she sleeps, 
her lips pushed out of shape against the pillow, her face soft and indistinct, functioning at that moment as a mnemonic device, other faces, other rooms. Just the circle of light under the desktop lamp making the red lacquer surface appear wet. She's in shadow. It's still dark when she gets up, takes a shower. She's a beautiful woman and I love watching her. The efficiency with which she lays out certain garments. Her ironical expression in the mirror as she makes up her face. I can see into the bathroom from where I sit. She's not paying attention to me. Is it any wonder she gets things wrong? She's groggy from sleep. After some time, the advantages of marrying a younger woman fade from the mind. But it's worth reminding yourself at certain moments, Maggie dressing for work, reaching over her shoulder to zip up a yellow dress, her tongue in the corner of her mouth. Maggie tugging the fabric into place over her sleek thigh. Maggie with one foot on a stool, fastening a strap over her instep. Maggie with a pearl in earring, both hands pinching at a single lobe. She is aware and not aware. Always you have to remind yourself that the tricks you use to seem attentive and engaged, other people use them too, while their minds like yours are buzzing with a thousand things. Well, a psychosomatic condition is still a condition, right? It's not the same, I say. She adjusts her brassiere. Don't get mad, she says, choosing her words poorly. I mean, you've told me about the kind of questions doctors ask about these things after an accident, psychiatrists and their surveys. We're discussing the article that I'm writing. This is some of what I've had so far. A paralytic lies in bed thinking she's too tired to walk across the room. A blind man complains the light is too dim for him to read the newspaper. These disabilities are real. But the lack of knowing is separate from that, the anisognosia, the result of an injury or else a deterioration. I had wanted to describe the causes and effects, but something kept going wrong. What would it feel like, I wondered, not to know something indispensable about yourself? Exasperated in that early morning before dawn, I got into an argument with Maggie, something that came up out of nowhere. I needed a distinction between what I was talking about and simple denial, which she failed to see. When I was 49 and she was 24, it was possible for me to think that I could make her happy, especially since she had pursued me with such stubbornness. Ten years later, I was no longer convinced, mostly because of physical alterations that I hid from her. I have the type of sharp wasp features that work fine for a long time, but then turn rapidly into a skull. I have kept my hair, but now wonder about how to restore some color, a formerly unthinkable notion. In my defense, the original shade of chestnut always struck me as artificial, especially when matched with pale or peeling skin. I was once athletic, which means my joints now are stiff and brittle with arthritis, particularly when I've been sitting for a long time. Now I get up from my desk and hobble to the bathroom, but I imagine her contemplating my backside from where she stands, appraising the imaginary dent in the back of my head. My work, which she once admired, presents a version of the same decay. As for sex, I take a tablet of sildenafil citrate. I divide it in half with a razor blade. I don't like to admit these things. In boys' adventure fiction, one encounters a recurring device, the fortress defended by a waning garrison until its defenses crumble all at once. I wonder if there might be jealousy in store for me. As a prophylactic measure, I have started an affair with a senior editor in a publishing house where Maggie works. I met her at a party and then later at my gym after dark. Sometimes I'm obliged to take a full Sidenafil tablet and schedule both women on the same day, which saves me money. <laughs> a man's life after a certain point is entirely a process of erection management. As my father once advised me, entirely? I take that back. It's sad, he conceded in a moment of candor. After Maggie leaves, I watch the light fill the long east window. Later, I'll pull the curtain, turn off the lamp, but I dread the moment when I lie down and close my eyes. My mind is sailed by images as clear and crisp as photographs, one after the other, as if I'm 
shuffling through the pictures in a zip drive transferred to my phone. Here is one, posed as if by a professional cinematographer, yet with the urgency of something captured through a voyeur's telephoto. Maggie at a table in the back room of Chez Guillaume, everything white, evening gown, tablecloth, teeth, candles, Russian. I myself no longer drink. Is it any wonder that we fought when she got home? She was late, it was almost dark, but I went back to where we had been that morning. You must not have understood what I was saying. I don't care about the experience. I'm not looking for some kind of phenomenological approach, I said, using words that I knew would infuriate her because of her background in art history. I barely knew what I was saying. Besides, I was telling her the opposite of what was true. That was another factor in our argument. Things went downhill. She was tired after a long day. I put on my raincoat, it was raining, and left the house past 8 o'clock. This is my favorite time, even in bad circumstances, and there is nothing like the city on a November night. In the rain, I imagined other softer, later, drier evenings, the leaves underfoot, the wind in the bare branches. The streets are crowded in my neighborhood until about 10.45 when they empty out, the people scurrying as if to find their seats in a darkened hall. At such moments, one is aware of the sounds obscured during the day, the tuning of the orchestra, a dog's high bark, the hiss of the pneumatic brakes on a sagging bus, a distant bell, a cop car, an alarm. I walked down the sidewalk and across the street. But after a few blocks, I got it into my mind to apologize or else demand an apology, which amounts to the same thing. In either case, I would be out of the wet. I turned to go back, and as I did so, I saw Maggie on the other side of the street, turning into a side alley. I thought she must have followed me. But immediately, I changed my mind because of the self-assured and decisive moments of her body. It was more likely she had not seen me at all. I crossed the street and stood under an awning in the dark. The consistency, uh, the consistency of the rain was changing now, the drops smaller and less distinct, tending towards mist. Could it be something like not being able to feel certain emotions, she had said, or not understand the needs and desires of other people? No, it wasn't like that. What I found frustrating was that she might as well have been talking about herself. In fact, she hadn't understood the first thing about what I was trying to say or about my discomfort. Now later, I watched her stride down the alley away from me. She passed under a yellow light. Straw-colored hair, long legs, holding an umbrella from our local PBS station. Wearing a coat I thought I recognized. In a normal marriage, I have found, after one has, for example, shouted at someone for no reason, one begins to fantasize about mortality. Not all at once. I thought as she reached the corner of the road that she might stumble over the curb, fall and slam her knee, and I'd be there to lift her up. A little farther on, she might suffer an unlikely accident like the one that had befallen me. A delivery cyclist, for example, might lose control of his machine on the wet cobblestones. She might break her head, a neat fracture along the occipiomastoid uh, occipio suture, as I had on a night like this. Or else something unique to her, something shocking, a bicycle spoke, for example, detached from the rim, could easily pierce her through the eye. How many times do I have to tell you, I might say, as I direct traffic around her or else disperse the curious onlookers? The spike of her own umbrella might stab her in an unguarded place. Certain Chinese assassins, I learned from a late night movie, are able to touch their victims with their extended forefingers in just such secret places to ruinous effect. Perhaps a light jab on her skinny breastbone might stop her heart, not all at once perhaps a thumb on the back of her head above her visual cortex, but she would stagger onto the other side of the road and then collapse. I would see her fall, a choked apology on my lips. I would start toward her, hold her in my arms as she gasped, bewildered, unsure even at the moment of death of what was happening to her. Her eyes would blink as she indicated her last wishes in a type of code. I imagined her funeral, her college friends who hated me and hate me still, her parents who despised me, yet even they grudgingly could recognize the intensity of my anguish. Dressed in a crisp black suit, I would stammer heartfelt words from the lectures at St. James. I felt safe 
picturing these things because she was so deft and competent in all her movements. She could do anything and nothing was her fault. Unaware of the danger she was in, she sidestepped opportunity after opportunity. No flower pot fell from the balcony above her as she turned west. No careening bus met her at the avenue under the streetlight. She stalked away from me through the wet dark and I followed after her, drenched now. My mood had changed. This was no aimless saunter. She was going someplace. I myself, as I left the house, had texted the senior editor, an overdue response to a worried question. And now I found it easy to convince myself that Maggie was on a similar errand. Who could blame her after all? Who or what could stop her, short of a falling safe or anvil? Or farther on, a lightning bolt. A cold drizzle in the comfortable night. A plane tree in its circular grating. A street lamp surrounded by a nimbus of mist. Now I hung back, and in the larger streets I allowed other pedestrians to come between us. Now I no longer felt any desire to apologize or console, admonish, berate, or praise. For 20 blocks, I tailed her through the dark, wet streets, curious to see where she was going, the address and identity of her secret husband. When Maggie and I first started sleeping together during my previous marriage, I had called her my secret wife. I followed her now along the edge of a small park under the bronze nose of a forgotten Central American dignitary high on his plinth. Past him, we were in another poorer part of town. In a single village in northern Sweden, 40 or so people suffer from a disability called congenital analgesia, which means they can't feel physical pain. This is not comparable to the problems of someone who is immune to other kinds of suffering humiliation, say, or jealousy or resentment. In no way is it comparable. Maggie paused finally at a clabbered house set back from the road, which was now made of cinder rather than the pavement. A cast iron fence blocked access to a leaf-strewn yard. From the corner, I watched her pause at the gate. When I say blocked, I mean symbolically. The fence wasn't more than three feet high and rusted through in places. I am not sure it will surprise you to learn as I watched Maggie unlatch the gate and then proceed up the flagstone walk, furling her umbrella as she did so, that it occurred to me to wonder if she was my wife at all, or whether I had followed an unknown woman across town, confused by a chance similarity in her walk and dress. Now it was too dark to accurately assess her face, even as she turned under the locust tree. But there was something in the way she moved that suggested a much older woman. She paused again on the front porch, then slipped inside, and I saw a light turn on in what must have been the hallway. This wasn't the first time. A few weeks before, I had seen her at a museum opening, walking down the main stairway, perhaps 20 feet away. Opening my mouth to speak across the crowd, I realized she was still at my elbow talking to some friends. Her voice was already in my ear. I thought she looked quite fetching in a gray rose dress I must have given her, but then it turned out she hadn't worn it at all. There is a hole in the fence at the edge of the property, and as I passed through it to the back, along a brick wall that divided the lot from the neighbors, I had no plan except to spy in the back windows so from the brick patio. Just in general, the tone here was different from the front of the house. A bird bath, a stretch of garden. Oh, the night was thick until the security light came on a bright circle. I could see Maggie inside. I'll still call her that. She opened the French window. George, she said, come in. Are you just going to stand out there? You'll catch your death. So I went up and went in. Thank you. So take that, John Crowley. Thank you, everybody. Um, Pung, do you have more books to sell? I do, yeah. There are more books to, to be bought, and um, Pung will sign them, and then she has to go to a surprise birthday party. <laughs> 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 and she told me she knew. <laughs> I had no well, one. I knew because they found out I had this Oh, right, so they had to tell you. Yeah, they told me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It's like, oh, what? We all spoiled the surprise. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you for our wonderful readers. Thank you for our wonderful bartender. Please buy another drink, hang out, tip her well, and I'll see you all next month. 
You have been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.